I've had my solar system for six months now and in this video I'll talk about the setup and how well it's performed so far. It's been an interesting start and I've got loads of interesting data and graphs to share with you. When I first started looking into solar it was around October 2022. We've had an extension being built and having the solar system installed at the same time made a lot of sense. We had our Tesla about six months at this stage and I'd had a Zappy charger installed knowing that solar was on the roadmap. Aside from the system itself, I wanted two very specific things. The, the first was the ability to load shift usage using the battery. We were on Octopus Go at the time and I wanted to take advantage of off-peak pricing charging the battery overnight. The second requirement was some sort of a local API in the inverter so that I could collect data and display it in my home assistant smart home software. After some conversations and some quotes, we settled on this setup. Uh, we had 12 400 watt monocrystalline panels split across two arrays, giving us a total of 4.8 kilowatts of generation. Both arrays face south, approximately 200 degrees. Connected to those panels is a 3.6 kilowatt Solax X1 G4 V2 hybrid inverter. Attached to that is a 5.8 kilowatt hour Solax triple power battery. This battery has a 90% depth discharge, giving 5.2 kilowatt hours usable storage. The system is also expandable up to 23 kilowatt hours. Now due to shading issues we knew we were going to get, we had Tygo optimizers installed on the panels and because I'm a data geek I had a Tygo cloud logger installed too so I could monitor the output of the individual panels. I'd already had a Zappy charger as I mentioned and in April I installed an Eddy solar diverter myself. So that's what covers what's in the garage. Uh, part of the quote also included an estimated annual generation and export. I'll come back to these figures at the end just to see how we're tracking. All in, the system was £12,000 and the payback was quoted at about 10 years. I was doing this more for CO2 and self-reliance than financial payback, but I was curious to see how the estimates tracked with reality. Now, uh, let's take a look at the arrays. This is the main array. That consists of eight 400 watt panels. As you can see, I've had the chimney stacks taken down and capped to stop them casting shadows. Uh, this photo was taken in mid-January when I was up on the scaffolding installing my Airex bricks and you can see the shadows from the neighbours chimneys. The Tyco optimizers come into play here and they help reduce the impact of the shadows. Here's a view of the same array from the street. The second array was installed on the roof of the extension, facing in the same direction. There's only four panels in this one, again 400 watts each. The house itself casts a shadow over these panels as the sun rises in the morning. So again, the Tygo optimizers help to get the best performance out of them. I did ask about having more panels installed on the extension roof, but the installer advised against it since the system would need to be redesigned. Here's a shot of that array from the scaffolding. During the installation, there were some issues getting the Tygo cloud logger up and running. It was the first one they'd installed, as I was the first customer to request one. They'd had some issues with range and needed to install some additional equipment to get it working. The dashboard shows you the performance of the individual panels. Uh, here you can see the current wattage from each one of the 12 panels. I haven't really done anything with this data yet, but it's reassuring to know it's there. If any of the prop panels develop problems, uh, the data here can help pinpoint the issue. To get the local data access working, I had to set up a Raspberry Pi to act as a bridge between the Wi-Fi network created by the Solex Pocket Wi-Fi dongle and my own network. This was quite tricky. Once I had it Working, um, I was able to set up some entities in Home Assistant to import the data every five seconds. 
This gives me near real time access to the data coming from the inverter, such as the PV output, the battery charge, and how much load the inverter is handling. The same API also works the other way, so I can send commands to the inverter, though I haven't done anything with that yet. The open Wi-Fi network is troubling from a security perspective. I have purchased a pocket LAN dongle, and I'm hoping to be able to use that instead of the Wi-Fi dongle. Let's start looking at some data. So here is the load in kilowatt hours on a typical day before the panels were installed. This data comes from a Shelly EM that I've clamped to the main live coming into the house. This is from October 5th, 2022. Uh, you can see a lot of usage in the morning, which is when we heat the hot water. You'll then see some other spikes during the day, which would be the kettle, the underfloor heating in the bathroom, and cooking the dinner in the evening. Our median usage across the day is about 230 watts. That's made up of the networking equipment, cameras, smart bulbs, smart relays, and other bits and bobs in standby. And I think this base load is probably about average. Now let's see how the system performed in its first six months compared to last year. These two graphs show the grid consumption in, in 2022 and 2023. Our monthly usage at the start of 2022 was about 400 kilowatt hours. In March, our usage jumped. This happened for two reasons. Firstly, I started heating the majority of our hot water using off-peak electricity. And secondly, we took deliver, delivery of our Tesla Model Y. This raised our average consumption by around 60%, taking it to 700 kilowatt hours a month. In 2022, we imported a grand total of 7,008 kilowatt hours. Looking at 2023, the impact of the solar PV is pretty obvious. Uh, you can see a downward trend with February being an exception as we went away on holiday. The total imported so far this year is 2,873 kilowatt hours. We're certainly importing less, but I won't be able to make a complete comparison until next April. Switching over to Home Assistant for 2023, you can see the solar generation rising across the year. February and March are about the same, around 200 kilowatt hours. As we enter spring, the solar output starts to climb, with June being the peak. That month, the panels generated 634 kilowatt hours of electricity. Looking at export, the picture's a little strange. You see, I didn't know I was responsible for registering the export with Octopus, so it wasn't until the 25th of April that they started tracking it. Whilst the total amount exported was 283 kilowatt hours, Octopus only saw 108 kilowatt hours of that. Uh, as I'm on the smart export guarantee, I earn 4.1p for each kilowatt hour, earning me a grand total of £7.38. It's not much, but instead of thinking about it in terms of money directly, I think about how that will buy me 98 kilowatt hours of off peak electricity. That doesn't sound like much, but it represents about 12 days of hot water. So let's take a look at January in more detail. On the 19th of January, the system was switched on and I had some cake to celebrate. I mean, who wouldn't? Now, as it was the middle of winter, we expected the generation to be very low, but we had a few days with over eight kilowatt hours of solar generated and we even managed to export some surplus, which was a welcome surprise. A total of 70 kilowatt hours was generated and if we assume the last 11 days were similar to the first, 20, uh, we could probably expect around 200 kilowatt hours to be generated next January, bringing in line with what we saw for February and March. The same view in Home Assistant is incomplete, as I didn't get the Raspberry Pi bridge up and running until the 27th. There is probably a way to import the missing data, but I just don't think it's worth the effort. Looking at the breakdown, 
Home Assistant underreported the solar generation as we've talked about, but the consumption and grid figures just don't add up. Um, I think it's because the inverter date is incomplete and one of my EV clamps was removed during the installation, causing a drop in the consumption figures. Uh, again, I'm not too fussed about putting this right. Jumping forward to June and it's a much better picture. It was very sunny, so the daily generation was very high for the first two weeks before it started to fall a little as cloud cover increased. We had seven or eight days where our grid import was zero. It's interesting to note that we also exported to the grid on those days, which gives me the impression that if I had more battery capacity, it would be taken advantage of. The best single day's generation was 30.3 kilowatt hours and the worst day being a measly 3.8 kilowatt hours. We consumed a total of 651 kilowatt hours, uh, which is a 70 kilowatt hour increase over the previous June. Of that 651 kilowatt hours, 113 kilowatt hours was imported from the grid. That is 472 kilowatt hours less than we imported last year. The export figure was 80 kilowatt hours, and I put some of that down to the fact that we didn't do much driving that month, uh, so the car battery was full, and we just had no way to use that power. If you take a look at the data from our Mixergy hot water tank, you can see the switch from gas to electricity that I made in March 2022. You'll also see the reduction in May June and July's consumption from the grid, and that's thanks to the eddy I installed. Now, whilst the eddy's been working very well, I'm not yet convinced that it was worth the investment. Uh, it's been installed for three months now, and I need to crunch the numbers, but, but based on the data so far, the savings for May and June are about 160 kilowatt hours. At off-peak rates, that's less than 13 pound. To start wrapping up now, uh, in the six months that the system has been installed, it's generated an impressive 2.56 megawatt hours. So if the last six months of the year are a mirror of the first six, I'm hoping we'll reach five megawatt hours of generation. That's 25% more than the installer estimated. Let's look at the effect of the solar and battery in terms of peak and off-peak imports. I'm currently charging the battery to 35% between 5 and 5.30 a.m. This is usually covers the usage until the sun is up and the panels are producing enough to cover the demand of the house. Uh, between the PV and load shifting, the difference between peak and off-peak from 2022 to 2023 is impressive. So far, 81% of the energy imported has been off peak compared to 62% last year. I'll have to wait until next April in order to make a real comparison, but these figures are certainly moving in the right direction. Lastly, let's have a quick look at my most recent bill, which covers May and June. You can see that we've consumed 369 kilo hours of off peak and only 26.1 kilo hours of peak rate. The average unit rate worked out at 9.16p per kilowatt hour, which isn't too far from the off peak rate, and I'm very pleased with this. To put it into perspective, our average unit rate for the same period last year was 20.47p per kilowatt hour. So combine that with the reduced consumption and our monthly bills have dropped. However, I'm gonna wait until I make a proper financial comparison in April next year. Right, that's it for facts and figures. Let's review. So the good. All told, I'm very pleased with how the system's performing. Uh, we've managed to load shift a lot of our imports to off peak, and we've had a few days during June and July where we've had no imports from the grid whatsoever. With the Eddy and Zappi, we've had lots of hot water and lots of miles powered by the sun. My wife and I became better at waiting for surplus before turning on things like the washing machine, but we can always do more. I, I need to find a better way to surface the expected generation information so we can choose the best times and we know when to wait. 
that's a project for another day. Uh, if you've any tips on how you do this, I'd, I'd love to hear them. On to the bad. So, first of all, we had issues with the inverters off-peak setup at the beginning. This was finally resolved by applying a firmware update to the inverter. This only highlighted to me how poor the inverter software and apps are. We then had issues where the Zappi was draining the battery during the day. Now, I've done a video on how I eventually solved this problem, which you might find interesting. We also learned that EVs don't start charging until they have a 1.4 kilowatt surplus. On very cloudy days, my system just doesn't generate that amount of surplus. For that reason, I installed an eddy so that I could mop up the smaller surplus amounts. Uh, it can divert as little as 100 watts. Uh, it's been very good at that, and some days there's been so much hot water from the day before, the mixergy hasn't had to heat any up. Uh, we've had problems with the water being too hot, which I've partially resolved by adjusting the elements thermostat. And I did a video on that too, which you, again, you might find interesting. So what's next? Well, I've purchased an open energy mon setup and I'm planning to install that shortly. Um, that will give me a better breakdown of where we're consuming power in the house. I'm also very keen on getting a breakdown from the Zappi so I can see how much solar goes into the car versus grid power. I've also got an idea on how to improve the eddy mixergy interaction using the charge level to control the eddy. So once I've done that and it works, um, I'll be sure and do another video. All in all, we're off to a really good start. The first six months has performed better than I expected, better than the installers expected. Um, I'm hoping to make a video each month, just kind of running through the stats for that month and covering any tweaks, changes I've made. If you've enjoyed this video or found some of the data useful, please do click the like button. That will help the algorithm. Uh, and if you want to join me on my solar PV journey, yeah, please do subscribe to my channel. If you'd like any more information or have any specific questions, uh, please add them to the comments below. I mean, have you started your solar PV journey? Because I'd love to know how your first six months went, just so I've got something to compare it against. Uh, please share your experience in the comments below. I'm Tom, and thanks for watching.